Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 6. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. This is the word of God. Amen. So, happy Easter, everyone. Happy Resurrection Sunday. And... What I wanted to say to you today was, what is the main point of Easter? Now, Easter has a lot of things. It it, kind of talks about a lot of things. There's a lot of intangibles surrounding Easter that's really good. But brothers and sisters and friends, the main thing that I wanted to say today was this is, the main point of Easter is there is life after death. Amen? That's the main point of Easter. The main point of Easter is, After death, the cessation of life, there is life. So uh, Matthew chapter 28, Hannah read this. Uh, This is basically what scripture teaches. Scripture says that there was an angel, and the angel went to the woman who went to the tomb to see the buried body of Jesus. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, which is just another word for saying, I know you're looking for Jesus who died. I know you're here to kind of uh, cover him with spices and anoint him. But verse 6 says, he is not here, for he has risen. He is alive. Just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. So what is Easter? What's the main point of Easter? Why do we as a church celebrate Easter? And the main point of Easter is we're basically celebrating today as a church that there is life after death, which the church traditionally has called it eternal life. So uh, since the beginning of, of Easter or since the beginning of resurrection, churches for thousands of years all around the world, thousands of people have been doing this traditional greeting together where every Easter Sunday, the pastor would say, brothers and sisters, church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ is risen And the church would respond by saying, he is indeed risen, hallelujah. He is risen indeed, hallelujah. So, you know, we want to join with the churches. We don't want to be the only one that's left out. We want to continue this tradition. I kind of like tradition. So uh, let's do this together, okay? So brothers and sisters, Christ is risen. Okay. Let's let's do it one more time, okay? (laughs) All right. So... uh, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. He is risen indeed. Okay? So Easter celebrates eternal life, life after death. Now, there's something very strange happening in our Western culture. Easter is not relevant anymore. Easter is not important. Easter is not celebrated as much. And in fact, Easter has become trivialized, where rather than the main point, we celebrate other things. Why is that? Why is that? You know, when I, uh, you know, maybe like once, I was able to celebrate Easter overseas, and it's huge. It's like, it's like a crazy party. But why is, it, why is Easter not celebrated so passionately here, where for some churches it's just another Sunday? Why is that? Well, I think one of the reasons why is because the reason why Easter is not relevant is because death is not relevant in our Western culture. You see, no one likes talking about the topic of death. You know, in the past, sex used to be a taboo topic. Now, death is the taboo topic. In the past, people freely talked about death, but when you talked about sex, that was an unwelcome topic. Now, when a pastor talks about sex, everybody wants to listen to it, but when a pastor talks about death, no one wants to listen to it, and they start criticizing and accusing the pastor. So death actually has become not relevant. In fact, in our Western culture, we deny death, we ignore it, we trivialize it. So the problem becomes that death actually becomes a lesser reality. And any time something becomes a lesser reality, we forget about it. And when you forget about it, you live as if that thing is not going to happen or you live as if you're never going to die. And for some of us, we've never even been to a funeral. They've hidden death away into a hospital where a lot of the quiet deaths actually happen there. So we don't think about it. 
We don't like talking about it. We deny it. We ignore it. We trivialize it. So when on Easter Sunday, the pastor comes up and he says, hey, you have eternal life from death, they're like, oh, cool. Why? Because there's a pastor, his name is Tim Keller. This is basically what he said. He said, death is an abstraction to us, something that's technically true, but unimaginable as a personal reality. Yeah, I know it happens, but it doesn't happen to me. It's something that, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not going to deny it, but I'm going to live as if that's not relevant in my life. But the Bible actually talk, talks about death a lot. The Bible actually says as a Christian, you've gone from death to life. And the Bible actually gives us a definition of death. But here's the problem. I think the reason why Easter Sunday is not really relevant to some people is because their understanding and their definition of death is actually different than what the Bible has to say the definition of death is. Because let me ask you, brothers and sisters, let me ask you, if I said to you, define death for me, define death, what would be your definition of death? And most people would say this. Most people would say the definition of death is the cessation of life. That's death. So that's the modern definition. Death is the cessation of life. But the Bible, Scripture, defines death in a different way. It includes that, but it defines death in a different way. The Bible, the Scriptures, define death not just as a separation, uh, not just as a cessation of life, but it defines death as the separation from God and all his gifts. It's a permanent separation from God and all his gifts. So, you know, kind of, uh, let me kind of try to unpack this a little bit. <clears throat> and I want to start with this. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. God loves the entire world. Can I get amen on that? Okay. God doesn't just love Christians. God doesn't look and he says, you know, I love these Christians. I hate these non-believers. God's not like that. That's not the heart of God. In fact, the Bible clearly says God loves the entire world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That is the extent and the power of God's love that he has for the world. Now think about it. You know, we had, we had these parents with these beautiful children. And you think any of these parents would give up their child for an, for, for an ungrateful world? No, right? That's the extent and, and the power of God's love. So God loves the entire world and God blesses the entire world and God shows his kindness and his grace and his blessings and his gifts to believers and non-believers alike. That's the heart of God. So Jesus talks about it in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, Jesus says to his disciples, he goes, hey, you got to love your enemies. You got to do good. You got to lend. These are people that, that, you know, they won't pay you back. Uh, they maybe not do good things to you. Uh, don't expect anything in return, but just love them, and your reward will be great. And then Jesus says this. He goes, when you do that, then you'll be just like your Father in heaven. Well, what's God the Father like? You'll be sons of the Most High, for he himself is what? He's kind. God is kind to who? To ungrateful and evil men. He is kind. God loves the world. God loves people that don't love him back. Uh, the Apostle Paul says this in Acts chapter 14, verse 17. The Apostle Paul, when he's talking about God, and he says, yet he did not leave himself without witness. So God wants to let the whole world know that he exists. God wants to let the whole world know that he's real. So what evidence does God give? What, how does he show himself? Like, how does he witness himself? And Paul says this, you know how he shows himself? He doesn't send lightning bolts to strike people and to burn them up and say, you better listen to me or, you know, you're going to hell. No, God doesn't do that. Instead, it says, in that he did good and gave you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. You know, some of us are like, why is rain a blessing? Today, I'm like, why is rain a blessing, right? But back then, rain was a great blessing because that brought about the fruitful seasons and that brought about food. And then it says, God gave you witness by satisfying your heart's with food and gladness. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that God has an incredible heart of kindness and love and, and, and grace and mercy to the entire world, and God's love is not just reserved for God's people. God loves the entire world. Can I get an amen on that? Isn't that great? Isn't that great? 
But here's the problem. People sin against God. That's the problem. People sin against God. Now, you know, definitions matter. Because if you and I have the wrong definition, we're never going to get on the same page. So we have a different definition of death. Some people just think it's the cessation of life and that's it. But scripture clearly says that death is actually an eternal separation from God and his gifts. But there's another definition. There's a definition of sin. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you, what do you think is the definition of sin? If I said define sin for me, how would you define it? You know, most people would define sin as drunkenness, stealing, sexual immorality. But are they sin? Yeah, they are, but they're behaviors of sin. What's the core of sin? What's the, root of, what's the root of sin that causes all these behaviors to come out? And what scripture teaches is the root of sin, the foundation of sin, is people choosing to live as if God does not exist, nor his will matter for our lives. That's sin. Sin is God is showing kindness. The Bible clearly says that. God is showing grace. God is satisfying the hearts of people that do not know him or reject him. And sin is you receive all that from God and you still choose to act like God doesn't exist and you still choose to act like his will does not matter for your life. And that's what scripture teaches. Scripture says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. By who? By everyone. Like everyone, in, and, and somewhere in their hearts, there's this acknowledgement and this understanding that there is a God being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. But here is what sin is. Verse 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Right? That's the core of sin. The core of sin is in the midst of God's grace and his kindness to the world, people receive God's gifts but don't acknowledge God as real and don't live as if his will matters for their lives. So what is death now? To bring it all back together, what is death? You see, death is God ultimately, finally letting us go to do what we've been consistently choosing to do here on this earth, even though that is not his intention. That is not his desire. You know, um, I want to welcome some of you guys because I only see you once a year. And and I'm really glad you came. And I was praying this week and I was like, Lord, what do I want to say to these people that they, you know, like there's that desire, but there's some sort of a barrier. And, um, you know, uh, God gave me so many thoughts. And uh, when I kind of like ordered it in my mind, it's like seven sermons. (laughs) And I said, Lord, how am I supposed to preach seven sermons? And I'm going to do it though. But trust me, it's not going to be long, okay? I'm going to try my best. But this is everything I want to say to you. Because I might not see you again. Okay, so this is why everything I want to say. Okay? In like summarized Cliff Note version, Spark Notes version. There's Spark Notes now. I don't even think Cliff Notes exists. Right? You know? So, so okay, listen to me, okay? Because, you know, uh, like these are things that like I had questions about. These are things that I commonly hear from people that are like, you know, struggling or far away or there's barriers or obstacles. And, and you know, one, and one of the things, and obviously I'm not going to answer everything, but I, these are the things that I struggled with when, when I became a Christian later on in my life. Uh, you know, so uh, people, people will say, why does God send people to hell? I can't believe in a God who sends people to hell, right? Uh, how could God be so mean and so uncaring? Brothers and sisters, if all the definitions that we said was right, if the definition of death is right, if the definition of sin is right, God doesn't send people to hell. People, people choose hell every day on earth. 
People choose hell every day on earth. So, because what is hell? Hell is living as if God does not exist, completely separated from God, uh, not caring about his gifts. So hell is nothing but the final resting place of a person who constantly chooses to, like, you know, chooses hell every day on earth. In fact, C.S. Lewis basically said this. He said, hell is the greatest monument of human freedom. Then hell is a world where sin is completely unrestrained, Right? Uh, heaven is a world where God's goodness and love and kindness and grace and mercy and justice and truth is at 100%. Then hell is a world where God's goodness, love, kindness, grace, mercy, justice, and truth is 100% absent, and we are living in the middle on earth, experiencing some of God's love, experiencing uh, some of, not experiencing some of God's love, different percentages all around the world. That's what's going on. Now, the earth is the, is the battleground between hell and heaven, and, and, and what we choose consistently here on earth will ultimately lead us to one place or another. You know why I say that? Because a lot of people say, man, I can't believe in a God who sends people to hell. You know what? God doesn't send people to hell. People choose hell every day on earth. Hell is not a world where God punishes and tortures people. Hell is a world where people punish and torture other people people right so that's one sermon number one is done let's go into sermon number two now okay all right so why does god allow suffering and evil then i can't believe in a god who allows suffering. i see i read the news i see what's going on in the world and i like if god is real and if god is powerful why does god allow all these bad things to happen now you know that's a very philosophical argument but i'm going to kind of break it down a little bit to more of a micro setting a lot of these people they say and you know what And the church has hurt me. Church has hurt me. I've been hurt by the church. In fact, the church is filled with hypocrites. And you know what my answer to that is? Yes, it's absolutely true. I completely agree with you. You have anything more to say to that? Yes, I do. Right? Church has hurt me. You know, church is filled with hypocrites. Yes, yes, it's true. But okay, let me kind of, let me ask you some questions here, okay? Are you, remember, definitions matter, okay? Definitions matter. Are you hurt by the church? So what is the definition of church? Here's my definition of church. Definition of church was the church started at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and started the church. And from that point, all the way around, the church includes thousands and thousands and thousands, millions and millions of people in different generations all throughout time, all around the world that constitutes this thing called the church. So when you say the church has hurt me, I can say this. I can say stuff like, oh, church hurt you? Did the apostle Paul hurt you? Did King David hurt you? Did Moses hurt you? Did Abraham hurt you? Did Adam hurt you? Well, Adam hurt all of us, so, you know, it's all even, right? You know, it's, it's, it's basically the, the, the terminology it's, it's, it's very difficult because when you say, I've been hurt by the church, that's different by saying, I've been hurt by some Christians. It's different by saying, I've been hurt by all Asians. All Asians hurt me. Or you could say, some Asians hurt me. And that actually matters a lot. But there's more. Because what we're talking is about hypocrisy. You know why people hurt people? Do you know why people hurt people? Because they have bad character. You know where pain comes from, relational pain? Poor character development. That's where hypocrisy comes from. You're not hurt because that person is a Christian. You're hurt because that person has really bad character. Now, how is character formed? How is is a person's character that blesses you or hurts you, how is it formed? And primarily, character is formed by our environment and our upbringing. The reason why you are the way you are today and the way you relate with another person is because your parents or your surrounding uh, relationships or your community formed and shaped you to have different values, different perspectives, different weaknesses, different strengths. And when you rub against a person that didn't come from your same background and you kind of, you know, rub against each other and cause uh, uh, friction and conflict with one another, someone's going to get hurt. So what am I basically trying to say? The reason why people are hurt in the church is not because of the church, but it's because of their character, which is formed over a long period of time, maybe even before the church, right? Church can change character, but that actually takes time. 
In fact, church can change character, but that character doesn't change when, unless that person agrees and commits to that change along with the support of the church. So if you're hurt by a Christian, maybe you're not supposed to say, I'm hurt by the church, but instead, rather than blaming the church, we should blame the past upbringing of that person that you were hurt by. But here's another thing, brothers and sisters, okay? Right? The church, what is the church? The church is a hospital for sinners and the sick, not a museum for saints. Can I get amen on that? Right? We shouldn't come here expecting people to be perfect. In fact, one of the words that God gave me for this church was that this church is going to be a hospital. And a part of me was happy and a part of me was sad because I'm like, man, there's going to be a lot of messed up, sick, jacked up people here. <laughs> right? But why does God bring people like that? Because he wants to heal them and restore them and renew them and sanctify them. But let me ask you another question. Are you hurt by Christians or are you hurt by Jesus? Are you hurt by Christians or are you hurt by Jesus? Don't let Christians stop you from coming to Jesus. Don't let Christians stop you from coming to Jesus. You know why? Because I know Christians hurt other Christians. I know you get hurt by the church. But this is what Jesus promises. No matter how much you're hurt by the church, if you stick with Jesus, he will bless you more than whatever pain that another Christian causes you. Amen? Right? But what the enemy does is whispers into your ear and takes your pain, and that pain not only leads you away from the church, but that pain leads you away from Jesus, ultimately bringing about a greater pain. And Jesus doesn't want that. We're not here because people are perfect. We're here because Jesus is perfect. But you didn't answer my question, Richard. Why does God allow suffering and evil? You got rid of evil, you get rid of most of suffering. See, I can't believe in a God that allows evil. He must be evil. He must not care. He must be absent. Why, why, Why does he not get rid of evil? Because if he got rid of evil, there'd be no suffering. This great question. You want God to get rid of evil? Right? You want God to get rid of evil? Right? Why does God do that? Right? But let me ask you. If God got rid of evil, he has to get rid of you. Right? Because aren't you at least little evil? Right? No, I want just big evil. Where do you draw the line? With me. They did that with Noah. You know what happened? He got evil once again. You know why God doesn't get rid of evil? Because he wants you to live. Because he so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. God suffers evil so that many people could live, right? You know, God gets slandered all the time. The guy's the most slandered man in the universe. Pastors do a bad job of protecting him too. Like, you know, proper definitions matter. But God doesn't want to get rid of you. He doesn't want to get rid of you. God wants to save you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, Jesus, he died on the cross to forgive those living as if God does not exist, to delay the judgment, to delay the judgment. The cross delays the judgment so that as God sends people out into the world with this message of peace and reconciliation, God is saying, there is a judgment to come. Time will run out, but I'm going to delay it as long as possible, receiving whatever you know, suffering that I do and my people do, so that as many people would choose to receive me as Savior and Lord once again. But what's the resurrection? Jesus rose again to defeat death and to show us that there is life after death. That's what the resurrection is. 
And then some people say, well, how does a person live? I have the hardest time believing in the resurrection. Right? What's the, what's the resurrection about? What does it mean? Right? And, and, and this is where, uh, this is actually the strongest uh, 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 argument of Christianity. The resurrection, this was my biggest problem. I mean, I had problems with evil. I had problems with hypocrites. I had problems with pain. But my biggest problem, maybe because, you know, like I, I, I'm, a, I'm a little nerdy. Uh, you know, my biggest problem was how does someone rise? That sounds so crazy. Did you know that is the greatest, strongest defense that Christianity has? In fact, when almost every single person carefully studies the veracity and the truthfulness of the resurrection, they ultimately come to faith in Jesus Christ. So if you're really interested, there's a, there's a really good book by N.T. Wright that talks about the resurrection, and I guarantee you that if you read it, that you will really find a lot of strong proof that the resurrection is true. It is easy, the most easiest, most defensible, the strongest answer that Christianity has. So what is death then? What is death for a Christian? In fact, the Bible says this. If you're a Christian, you'll never die. You'll never die. Like that, that's how they define it. So, you know, in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, never, will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Right? Basically, death has two doors. Death has a door that leads to eternal separation from God and his gifts. And death has another door that leads into the presence of God and his gifts. And God brought about the death and resurrection of his son to create the longest time possible so that as many people would choose the door into his presence and his gifts once again. Right? That's what it is. But some people say, Ah, it's not so bad, right? I've been living without God for a long, long time and my life is okay. Like, it's not that bad. In fact, my life is good. Isn't it only the suffering and the hurting and the struggling that needs Jesus? Because that's basically how we communicate the gospel these days. We say, hey, if you're suffering, if you're struggling, if you're going through a hard time, if life is difficult, then turn to Jesus. Yes, that's kind of true. But you know why your life is good? You, you know why like, nothing bad is happening to you? You know why things are great? It's not because of you. It's because of people praying for you. It's because people who have a relationship with God that cares about your soul, that's desperately calling out to God for your salvation and for your blessing, that God out of his grace and mercy is answering because of them for you because he wants you to have that heart that these people have. But we think, oh, it's just us. No, it's often the prayers of other people around you that love you and care for you so much. Right? Okay, fine. Richard, fine. I'm doing this internal dialogue in my head. Fine, okay, right? But you know what? Here's another issue. Jesus just doesn't seem real to me. Jesus doesn't seem real to me. He just seems like a concept. He just seems like something I just talk about. I don't really feel anything. In fact, when I come to church and I stand next to someone, it seems like that person is having a genuine experience with Jesus, and I'm just sitting there, and I just feel like I'm just going through the motions. Uh, you know, the way you guys talk about Jesus, that's not Jesus, I really want to experience Jesus, but I don't really feel anything. That's great. I'm glad you're saying that. But let me ask you a question. Do you hold hands with a stranger? Right? Like if a stranger came up to you and held your hand, would you think that was normal? Would you think that was okay? Would you kiss a stranger? Right? Well, no, the answer is no. <laughs> right? I don't know. We live in a weird world these days. Right? I have to like clearly define things and you know, like not take things for granted. You don't hold hands with a stranger. You don't kiss a stranger, okay? Like I'm not going to ask for an amen, but you know what I'm saying, right? But here's the thing, brothers and sisters, right? You don't kiss a stranger. You don't hold hands with a stranger, and you don't complain about it. You don't complain about it. In fact, before you find intimacy with someone, you need to make an effort, Intimacy is the result of commitment and effort. This one pastor said this. I thought it was really crude. He said, Jesus doesn't do one-night stands. Right? It's crude. But it gets the point across. Not from me, but from this pastor. <laughs> right? 
You know, um, I used to like Disney movies. Not anymore. Something weird happened to Disney, right? But before I used to like it. Man, they used to pump out some great classics, right? You guys remember Tangled, right? That was a good movie. There, there was this one song. It says, you know, uh, at last I see the light, right? It's like the sky is new. The world has somehow shifted all at once. Everything looks different now that I see you. Dang, that's pretty good, right? Right? You should sing that to someone, right? You guys remember Little Mermaid? Little Mermaid was the first movie that my wife and I, we went on a date on, right? You know, so she was like, hey, my favorite movie is Little Mermaid. I said, hey, you want to go see it? Right? She goes, yeah. I said, okay, let's go. It's a date. <laughs> right? So we went there, and then you guys remember the song Kiss the Girl? Right? You know, there you see her sitting there across the way. She don't got a lot to say, but there's something about her. You don't know why, but you're dying to try. You want to kiss the girl. You might remember that, right? Sha -la 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 -la. <laughs> you guys remember that, right? 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 So, you know, I'm just trying to bring back memories. Bring back memories of these Disney movies. Now, 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 why am I saying that? Well, here's the point, brothers and sisters. You never hear these songs at the beginning of the movie. You never hear these songs at the beginning of the movie. The song does not start the movie. Wouldn't it be weird, right, if Kiss the Girl was the first thing that happened in Little Mermaid? I used to love Little Mermaid, and then I became a dad, and I hate Little Mermaid. <laughs> right? What are you doing, disobedient, rebellious daughter? Listen to your father who knows everything, right? <laughs> right? But before I became a father, I liked Little Mermaid, you know? So you never hear these songs at the beginning of the movie. It's too weird. In fact, it's always at the end or it's always at the middle. Why? Because these songs are too intimate. These songs are too intimate. These songs to a normal human being only make sense after you make the decision to get to know each other better. Right? These songs only make sense after adventure and suffering and danger and opponents and experiences and time together. Only after these things can you sing the song together. And in fact, the song only gets deeper and more intimate as you continue the adventure, right? You know when someone says, yeah, I haven't really experienced him. I don't know if he's real. I just feel like he's just a conceptual thought. You know what I'm hearing in my heart? That person wants to sing the song. That person wants to hear, sing the song that God has planted deep inside that person from eternity's past. Brothers and sisters, do you want to sing the song? You got to take the courageous step and start a relationship. You got to say, I want to get to know this guy. I want to get to know this guy that everybody's hyping up, talking about he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Who is this guy? Because the people that talk about him, they're not crazy. In fact, they're pretty sane. I'm in relationship with them. They're my parents. They're my children. They're my friends. They're my siblings. And they seem to think that he is the answer to life. I should at least check it out. I should at least get to know. Right? That seems like common sense to me. You know, I didn't grow up a Christian. I kind of like it. You know, I wasn't born into the church. I wish I was baptized as a baby. I wasn't. Right? I didn't become a Christian until college. So I grew up in a non-Christian world, non-Christian worldview. Uh, by nature, I'm actually a very skeptical person. So I'm not the type to, like, jump in and easily believe things. In fact, when everybody's going this way, I'm like, whoa, stop it. Why are you guys all going this way? Right? So I kind of like it. And then I came to college. And I joined this uh, campus ministry. And, you know, um, uh, they, and all these people that, you know, I was like, oh, you guys are cool. Um, uh, two things happened. So this one pastor, he came up to me. And then he said, hey, Peter. I'm like, Richard. Oh, I said, sorry about that. Richard. <laughs> right? called me Peter for like two quarters. <laughs> and then, you know, he's like, hey, you want to join a Bible study? I was like, ah, I don't know. He goes, oh, no, you should do it. It's a discipleship. Goes, I don't know. And then my, all my friends were like, do it, do it, right? Do it, it's important, do it, you know? 
Like, you know, do it. Like, you know, one person like, do it. If you don't do it, we're not going to hang out with you. Like, what? <laughs> Remember, college freshman, right? You know, and then so I, I did it. And then second thing was uh, there was this one girl, and uh, uh, she was one of my friends, and she was like, she, we started talking about spiritual stuff, and she goes, hey, do you believe in God? And I was like, I think I do. I'm not sure. Because are you Christian? I, don't, I think I am. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Like, you know, I'm like, I just don't know. And then she was like, you do quiet time? I go, what's a quiet time? And she goes, you don't know quiet time? I was like, this is not a good way for you to share the gospel with me, right? You're, <laughs> right? And then, you know, she's like, you know, quiet time is basically you, you know, every day you read the Bible and you pray. And then she was like, if you believe that, you know, uh, what, before you pr- uh, pray, ask God, to reveal himself to you and read. And I'm like, nah, I don't want to do that. She goes, you know, no, you should. You got to do it every day. She goes, do it for two weeks. I'm like, two weeks is too long. And then, you know, remember, we're freshmen, right? She looked at me. She goes, oh, it's because you can't do it. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? Of course I can do it. I don't want to do it. She goes, no, you can't do it. You're weak. And I was like, how are you sharing the gospel to me? <laughs> and then, you know, like my pride kicked in. I was like, fine, I'll do it. So along with this discipleship, along with this Bible, uh, you know, uh, this quiet time, you know, I did it for like two weeks, you know, and doing that. And then God slowly started to warm my heart. God slowly started to draw near. I slowly started to get into a relationship with God. And then that was the beginning of me saying, he's real. He's real. I believe. This makes sense. I want to place my trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And then, so I told, I told my people, I told this group, I was like, hey, I think I believe in Jesus. Everybody went crazy. They're more happier than I was, right? This is crazy. Think about it. How crazy does that sound, right? They were more happier than me than I was. I was like, I think I'm a Christian. Everybody's like, ah, right? Right? They're like, some people were like crying. I'm like, Why are you crying? I'm Christian. We... Right? And then, you know, uh, I, this one girl, she came up to me. She goes, I've been praying for you since like the beginning, right? This older sister which is crazy, right? She, she's been praying for me since like, she said, first time I met you, I've been praying for you and I'm so glad that you're a Christian. And then I was like, dude, thank you. And then she graduated because she was senior, I was freshman and then she left. And then for, uh, like two years ago, I saw her again at Southland. And then she looked at me, she goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> I go, I'm Christian. <laughs> she goes, what else? She goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm pastor too. <laughs> She goes, you're pastor? She's like, whoa, God. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm going to plant a church in Chino. She goes, really? And she came with us. Yeah. See, that's power of gospel. That's power of prayer. People have people praying for me that I came to know Jesus. Right? Think about it. The people who love you, the people who care for you, the people who will die for you, the greatest gift that they think they could ever give to you is eternal life relationship with Jesus. Think about it. The one thing that they could give to you out of their incredible love for you is that you have a relationship with God. Right? These are not strangers. You know know what blew me away this week? We prayed every night. Every night for people that were far away from God. Every night for people that didn't know Jesus. And to be honest, I didn't think that many people would show up because, you know, like people pray selfishly. So everybody comes out during New Year's prayer because, you know, they're like, God, bless me. I dedicate myself to you. Bless me, Lord. But this is not for you. This is for other people. We had more attendance we had more people show up for this prayer than the New Year's Eve prayer. People praying, I love this person so much that the greatest gift that I want for this person to have is eternal life with Jesus. Right? But you need to participate in that. If Jesus is so important to people that you love and respect, don't you owe it to explore and seek this and give it a fair shake, right? Rather than saying, I'll see you next year, which I'm so glad you come every year. 
because it will give you long enough time to forget everything I said, so when I repeat the story, <laughs> you will say, oh, makes sense. Right? So brothers and sisters, right? There's two doors. Which door will you choose today? Which door will you choose today? Now here's the blessing of the door. When you choose to open the door that leads into the presence of God and his gifts, that door stays open so that while you're still here on earth, the presence of God and his gifts is not only waiting for you in heaven, but it goes through that door and starts going into your present earthly life here. And because people love you so much, they want you to be able to experience that even a little bit while you're here on earth. So I know it takes a lot of courage to step into church, especially if you've been hurt. I'm, I thank you for the courageous step you took to come here. Right? And remember, a church didn't hurt you. Christians hurt you. We probably haven't hurt you because we're still new. <laughs> right? We, we just started. So you're more than welcome here. Okay? And may you really focus on the relationship that God wants to have with you. Okay? Let's pray.